beginning in 2008, Little Tapping Toys has grown to be the largest toy seller on Etsy. Let me see my notes here. All right, well, um, Kimber and I, we met uh, in the Army in 2003. And shortly after we were married, we got a job where we traveled the country um, remodeling hotel bathrooms. And we did that for about 18 months. And it was an awesome experience because it put us like in businesses all the time. We lived in businesses, we ate in businesses, we did everything in businesses. And it gave us an awesome perspective because we were consumers and we were able to see from a com consumer's perspective, how those businesses could be better and how they could create a better customer experience. And that, as we'll talk about it, kind of translates into the business that we have now. Um, while we were doing that, we realized that we we're a pretty good team and we decided that we needed to work on becoming a better team. And so during that, I said 18 months, it was actually 13 months, but during that 13 months, we worked really hard on being a really good team and working together really well because we knew that no matter what we did uh, with our own business, we would be a success at it. And it's interesting, we have um, a stack of notebooks that's like this tall that is just business ideas. And it's not just ideas, but it's like, plans on how we could get those going and, and do all this. And this was 2004, 2004, 2005, when we did, well, 05, 06. And it's interesting because some of the businesses, business ideas that we had are like actual viable businesses now on the internet. And um, so it just goes to show you that we had some pretty good ideas. And this was kind of our preparation phase for little sapling toys. Um, one of the really important things that we did when we were on the road is we wrote down our values, our strength, and our goals. And it really helped us to put into perspective like what we wanted out of life, what was really good, like what we could do really well, and how to get there. And we had no idea what our business was going to be. We just knew that we were going to have a business together. And that really set kind of a foundation for what we wanted in our lives. And I'm going to let Kimber uh, tell us a little bit more. Okay, so when we got off the road, we moved to Eureka, California. And we kind of consider that, well, we definitely consider this our startup phase of our business. Um, when we were, when we first got there, we um, started turning our um, talking into trying. So we took low risk situations to try out business. Not the business ideas that we had been brainstorming, but just small things to see how we did. We knew we were a good team, but um, to see how we did in business. Um, so we did things like odd jobs, and we were going to school um, at that time we thought we would open a historic inn because Nick was doing a program of historic preservation and restoration and I was doing a hospitality uh, program and so we thought we would do a historic um, inn together um, but that didn't pan out because it came. <laughs> so, and then we each had jobs. So I was working at a small business and um, learned how to take care of customers and um, saw how the business owner uh, took care of his business. And one of the most important things that we did was, so Nick worked at a lumber yard woodworking store and they had moved locations. So they ha were having a grand opening and we made cookies and candies to sell at the grand opening. But we didn't just make cookies and candies to sell at the grand opening. We made sugar cookies in the four shapes of the, in four tool shapes of the four tools they sold the most in the four brands that they sold them. So they were, we made the cookie cutters at like, a, for example, there was a circular saw and we made the cookie cutter and, and um, then that 
circular saw was available in the different colors of the four brands that they sold. Just to show you how in depth we go every time we have an idea and, and we, we do something. Even we didn't, I never thought we were gonna sell cookies for a living, but just as a small business thing. And so that was one of our first um, things that we tried ourselves that um, gave us some experience. So we, we found out we were pregnant and started doing, so, and so um, Nick made Rex a rattle. It's the one on the, on the left um, for his birth rattle. And then he had fun, so he started making rattles as gifts. Um, the one in the middle, which he's completely embarrassed about, but he made that as a gift for somebody. And there's a lot of in between these, but there's no Instagram or anything. There's no pictures. <laughs> and, um, and the rattle on the right is what we sell today. Um, one of the things we sell today. So, um, and during this time when we were uh, had a new baby, we were meeting with other we were meeting other parents and going into children's shops, and we started to see a few wooden toys pop up here and there, but all of them were lacking in design. And there was one one experience in particular where I had a little play date with another mom. We had newborns, so I'm not sure why we did it, but she pulled out a teether that was kind of knobbly. It was just, there's, there was no design to it, and I, I just took it from her like it was candy, and I just examined it, and I couldn't believe that she had purchased this. She had gotten it on Amazon, and and so when Nick got home that night from school, I said, let's do this. Let's start this business. Once we said, let's do this, we got very intense <laughs> very quickly about what we were, um, what we had in front of us. Um, we planned our product line. This is our initial product line. Um, we just took this from our sold orders <laughs> on Etsy from that, that very beginning. Um, so we planned our product line, um, which is the fun part, the designing. We did the pricing, figuring out the materials, the packaging, and a lot on the branding and customer experience. So this is one of our first rattles, how they came in wood shavings with a little printed card saying where it came from. Um, and we had a long, intimidating to-do list, um, especially because we were in California, it, there's a, it's, there's a lot of legalities to having your own business, and we had no experience in those things, and there were, we had no mentors. There weren't a lot of, um, now that I'm saying this out loud, I never thought to ask my employer for any help. <laughs> but um, we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have anyone to ask when we had questions. We just powered through. Um, we went to the local SBDC center and took classes. Um, we had to figure out our photography, which was always a struggle. Um, our graphic design, I actually switched my major to graphic design, um, but they had a terrible program. I mostly learned how to use PowerPoint. Um, I took a <laughs> web development, um, selling and consignment, organization and sourcing. Um, so how we started selling, we had our product line, and you can go to the... Um, Next one. We had our product line, and we were going from store to store trying to sell it to them. We were in Vermont that summer for a, a woodworking, a preservation conference, and had my dad FedEx out a bunch of our toys so that we could sell them store to store. And we just weren't selling too much, and it was trying. And that, um, that August, so we were, I, okay, so at this time we were working and going to school and starting the business, but we had already had it in our plan to slowly stop working and um, go to school more with the financial aid. And so it worked out with the business to fit into that. And um, so we actually quit work before we were even selling because we were going to school. Um, so. We quit work when we had the business but weren't selling yet. So we were trying to get our stuff in the stores. And then as soon as we put it on Etsy, we started selling it. And stores started coming to us. So then that was a no-brainer no to follow that path. Um, so 
we continued in California for about another six months after that, just picking up um, momentum and working on our products. Um, we started offering more innovative products that weren't available yet at the time from anywhere else. And um, I saw a motivational speaker at this time, and she was talking about the value of goals. And she said something about, I don't remember what she said, but whatever she said made me think, um, like, I need to set a goal of what I want our gross income to be for, our gross uh, income for in the business to be for this first year. And the number 66,000 popped into my head. And that first year, I think our gross was 67,000. So that was amazing to me. Um, and that really um, gave me a, a firm belief in setting goals and, and what that can do for us. So we needed to move from where we were at. And we um, moved on to Idaho. And Nick is going to talk about Idaho. So <laughs> Idaho is, uh, we kind of refer to it as our, as our development phase. Uh, we had the business. We had started living off of it full time. And this is where we needed to really make it work. Um, and so there was a lot of things. So I, I come from a family that everyone in my family has advanced degrees. Kimber comes from a family that is all very intelligent and advanced degrees. and so. It was kind of hard for us to, to say, this is what we're going to do. And we had to kind of use our reason and logic, like, this is what we're good at. This is what we're going to do, instead of feeling the obligation that that's what we had to do, because everyone else we know was doing it. And I just use school as an example. We didn't feel like, you know, there, every one of us has things where we have to use our reason and logic to overcome guilt and obligation when you're starting a business. It doesn't matter what it is. That just kind of happened to be our biggest thing. Um, so once we started selling, this is kind of an interesting paradox, is once you start selling something, you got to figure out how to make money selling that thing. So yes, you made this thing, somebody wants to buy it, and now you got to figure out, if I'm going to make this thing again, I need to figure out how it's not going to take me 20 hours to make this one thing, and I'm only going to charge 10 hours for it. And so that was something that in the, our Idaho phase, we, we came to realize really quickly, like, we've got to get so that we can do it fast, so that we can make our product consistent, and that we can make it um, at a price point that people are going to want. So our design process, um, or our production process is is pretty automated. We have a CNC machine. We have laser engraver. We use those tools to help us to, to get to make our products at the price point that we can sell them at. And that's kind of our design process as well. Um, our designs, they, so we look a lot. We have three kids. We let them play with our toys. We look at the way kids play with toys. And we kind of figure out what toys would be good from that. And we also um, keep a price point in mind. Like, I can sell this, but can I sell it for this much? And then we figure out from the form and the function, the price, and how we're going to produce it quickly. And so that's kind of our design process, is we design the form, the function, the price, and the production all together. So we come up with an idea for a project. We say, is it going to be beautiful? Are kids going to want to play with it? Are people going to want to buy it? Like, because kids don't have money, so are their parents going to think that that's nice enough to bring into their home? Can we make it for a price that people are going to want to spend it at? And how much is it going to cost us to produce that? Um, and something that I do, so we sell a lot of blocks. And you can see we have some blocks over there, and they, they have pictures on them with our laser engraver. I would say I've probably made, in the course of the eight years, probably, I don't know, 750,000 blocks, maybe even more. But every time I'm cutting a block, I'm thinking about, how can I do this faster? How can I do this better? And I'm always thinking about, 
the, a better way to do stuff, and that's something that you can never let up on. Because if you do, you're going to get outpaced. Somebody's going to come up with a better idea before you do. And so we've made some uh, changes in our production. And we've kind of learned what our core business is, like what we do and what we don't need to do that we can let somebody else do and bring it in for us to finish. And that's been something that's really been important. And one of the... Um, uh, so we, have it, we had a CNC. We had it for about a year. It was small. It was just kind of a consumer grade one. It wasn't working, so we upgraded to, uh, it was actually smaller, but it was heavier duty. <laughs> but we upgraded to that one. We ran that one for about four years. And then just a few years ago, we got a big one that allowed us to use um, like plywood products. So you'll see like our rocking horses and the cube chair and stuff, those are made with a big CNC machine. And that has allowed us to do a lot more things that we weren't able to do before. And it's because we were always thinking of, how can we do this better? How can we make it faster? Um, while we were in Idaho, I remember my sister-in-law who's sitting here, she was visiting us, and we got our 1,000th Etsy sale. And that was awesome. I, we just knew, like, once we got that, we were set. and. So that was really exciting because that year in Idaho, um, well, Kimber's going to tell you about that. But so one thing that we had to do is um, while we were there, the federal government came out and said we have to logo our products and put some kind of uh, tracking on them. We need to have where it's made, where it's made, where it's made, where where it's made and, when it's and when it's made on them, and who made it, and so. When you're sending out a you know thousand products, and you have to make something that does that on every single product, we had to think of a solution. And this is kind of what I was talking about, where you're thinking about a process to make things better. And I was thinking of like a branding iron that you heat up, and you can change like the little numbers and stuff. And I was looking into them, and it wasn't exactly what we wanted. And so I started looking online, like branding and logoing, like all this stuff, searching everything I could. And that's when we came across our laser engraver. And so that had, and we were, we were thinking like laser engraver, awesome, we can logo our products. But that allowed us to start doing the alphabet blocks and start putting pictures on our stuff and personalizing our stuff and making all these things. And so it was something that was a solution to a problem, but it ended up being like its own part of the business, like just totally changed our business. And so that was really exciting when we got that. And this is an example of some of the engraving that we're able to do on one of our rattles there. Um, and so once we had kind of gotten into that development phase where we're learning how to make this business be profitable and make us money, then we kind of entered into a growth phase, and that is really exciting. So I'm going to let Kimber tell you about that. Kimber, tell you. Our growth phase was in Wisconsin. We moved to Sheboygan, and we thought we'd be there forever. Obviously, didn't work out there for us, but um, we had a lot of good experiences. As soon as we moved there, we just started growing like crazy. We put everything into it. I actually had a really hard time um, coming up with what to say during this part because I don't remember a lot of it. It's like when you have two kids really close together and you don't remember the babyhood of the second one. Um, that's what it, it was just very intense. So we, we had goals when we moved there. We wanted to, oh, I'm supposed to talk about publicity first. Okay. <laughs> so, Back step, we started getting a lot of publicity. Um, we were on Etsy's things um, and then picked up by MSNBC and Forbes. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we get, and then Country Living did, um, they're making a country living on us and sent out a photographer. And we get asked a lot how we landed these and really it was by focusing on our product, our branding, um, 
and the things that we were always working on. It wasn't, not that there's anything wrong with businesses that start and just start reaching out, but that's never what we did. We landed these from focusing on our own business. Um, so then back to the goals that we had when we moved there, we really wanted to hire employees and be able to pay them a living wage. Um, we wanted to have the shop and, ho and our home together in the city and just have as much growth as possible. We had this idea of, well, it was more than idea. We, we were working towards having a retail shop with the wood shop behind it, the working wood shop behind it with glass so you could see Nick and the employees making the toys and then we would live above it. Um, as we tried and tried and tried to make this happen, it just was not working. We ended up having, owning a home um, just north, it was in the city, but it was on the north end of the city and then having, uh, renting a shop downtown and then we had all of these employees which was a blessing and a curse. Some of our employees were wonderful. We hired autistic employees through a program that placed them with job opportunities and they were wonderful and we loved working with them. But then we also had a lot of hard things that we had to deal with with employees um, and constant stress to worry about paying all of these people and our own mortgage and, and things like that. And as time went on, we just realized that we were miserable and it wasn't, it wasn't what we had wanted. That initial goals and strengths um, sheet that Nick was talking about that we had written out wasn't being fulfilled. So we decided to step back. Um, is there anything else I should talk about, Sheboygan? Okay. Save your name, everybody. Sheboygan. <laughs> Um, so when we took a step back, we did it by moving back to Utah and letting our employees go. And uh, on to me. So I'm going to say our Utah phase is kind of our relearning phase, our re, our, our smart growth phase. Um, one one thing is that when you have your own business, you're it, like you are the person who does everything. Like when Kimber was saying, we need to start up, you know, or when, when we were in California, we wanted to start our business. Well, no one else was gonna apply for the business license and register with the state and um, do all those things. Like it's, it's up to you. You are the only person that you can rely on for everything. And that's, that's hard, but it's also awesome because you don't have to worry about anyone else. And well, here in Utah, um, we reached our 20,000th and 30,000th Etsy, Etsy sales. And um, that was really exciting for us because that really, like, now we're really like, hey, we can do this. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like 10,000 that we got that in Wisconsin, we're like, hey, we can do this. And every time we were like, hey, this is what we're doing and we can do it. And it makes it really exciting. Something that we learned here in, uh, oh, it's Kimber's turn, sorry. She's gonna tell you all about this. Okay, we're almost finished. So we really, as we took a step back, we really worked on honoring ourselves, our goals, our business, and making the right decisions um, for us. Where is the decision slide? Did we go through it already? Oh, we did. Sorry. Um, so some of the things that have, we have gone back and forth on through our years in business are, is wholesale first? Custom orders and wholesale. So with custom orders, it's so hard because at first you, you, you kind of need to do it, well we did, to get the business. And then it's hard to say no, especially when it's something that maybe isn't too far out of what you're doing. I love hearing custom orders. They give us a lot of ideas for products that we end up offering. Um, this is a custom order we did at the very beginning. Does anyone know what that is? It's a wood representation of the Guggenheim Museum. <laughs> 
it's pretty intense. And Nick did it by hand. He had I, no. I want, this was before I had a CNC machine. So I just want you guys to soak that in. <laughs> <laughs> they were considering selling them in their museum, but there was no way at the time that we could have done something like that. Um, and so, and then, so with wholesale, or no, with custom orders, it's still, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I have my employee, Emily. She just lets me know um, when people have an idea, and most of the time I know right away, nope, we can't do that. Um, but sometimes it's a great idea, and I have already been thinking about adding it to our product line. And then with wholesale, we've been all over the place with wholesale when we first started. Everything we had was available at wholesale, and it was probably about 50% off, I don't know. Um, and then when we got to Idaho, it was overwhelming, and we felt like we just weren't making enough money, so then we cut off wholesale completely, and we've been everywhere in between. And I feel like now we've found a really good place for ourselves, and I feel, um, I feel like when I talk, I get asked a lot by other small businesses what to do about wholesale, and I just want them to know that wholesale is on your terms. You get to choose what you do for wholesale. So even if you hear it has to be 50% off or you think whatever, you get to choose what you do. So what we have ended up doing is a select um, selection of our products are available at wholesale and we have tiers of wholesale pricing and even the largest tier isn't 50%. And for us, we have enough retail sales that that's fine and, and we can kind of say to retail shops, you can take it or leave it and they choose to go either way. Um, and so um, honoring yourself, so another thing that has been a struggle is photography. I hate photography. I hate product photography. I hate any kind of, I just don't like doing it, I don't like editing it, and so um, luckily, well, it's a wonderful thing for us that um, my cousin Jethro, his wife is a photographer, she started up and just started working really hard, and, and when we moved back here, we were able to commission her to take photos um, of products, and, and we weren't quite sure, I, I don't know, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was rocky at first, but it, we've, what I'm trying to say is we've reached a good place now where we pay her monthly and she just takes pictures all the time and it's been amazing for me. <laughs> and so right now with our products, okay, so this is how, I always wanted white background photos and at the time I could not figure out how to do it and I couldn't find someone to teach me how to do it and I really struggled with it. And so this is what, this is as good as I could get, which isn't too bad. And we, this is what we had um, for years. And I didn't, if I had, I guess I'm trying to say, uh, I didn't let it keep us from being in business, even though it wasn't what I wanted. And now this is what it looks like and this is what I always wanted. And so I'm able to take the pictures and send them to Robin and she edits them for me and then she takes like all of our pictures, our lifestyle pictures, and it's amazing, and it makes me so happy that I don't have to deal with it anymore. Um, and so when, when we moved to Utah, we moved to Cedar City, and this whole time that we'd been in business, we'd really been turned in. We were very competitive, and that's one of the things that drove us to keep going, was just being competitive with anything that we could compete with. <laughs> and but then, and so I didn't really want to be in contact with other people. I did trade a lot. I traded with um, Ash <laughs> um, years ago, and lots of I've traded with lots of people, and it was wonderful. But I didn't want to go to events. I didn't want to talk to people. We were invited to do the West Elm Etsy West Elm Etsy pop up shop, and I just hid on the couch while Nick talked to people and sold things because I was just so uncomfortable. And then when we were in Cedar City, I just, all, all of a sudden I needed it. I needed connection. And so um, I contacted someone um, up here and asked if she knew of anything and she directed us to this. So we started coming to Creative Collaborative a year ago. We um, 
freshly picked was the first one we went to. And now we're taking every opportunity we can to, to network and meet people in our community. And now we live up in Huntsville um, in Ogden Canyon. And being able to do this has been wonderful and it's added a whole new um, perspective and drive in our business and um, opportunities for collaboration. One of them being the Little Sapling State, State Series that we've done, having people take pictures of, of states and provinces in, in their home state. Um, and yes, we did that on Instagram. So um, we we stepped back and then we have just been growing. We've been growing in a smart way instead of just any opportunity we can. We've just been honoring ourselves in our growth and we're so happy with where we are now and what the future looks like. And um, we're just very comfortable. So we're gonna end with um, a video um, that we had made earlier this year um, of our business at home. I can get it to play. Sorry, I'm not a computer guy. <laughs> yeah. Just give it time. It's just music, so. Questions? Yes. I have one. This is more like going to bed, so I wondered, were, was there any point that you guys like, had tears? Um, yeah, it usually comes about midnight every night. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And it, 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 I don't. Well, the guilt and obligation thing, that was a fear to not go back to school and, and finish. That was a fear to make that choice. And um, I, I think lately. Well, when we were in Wisconsin and we grew too big, yeah. that was, and we were miserable, we were very scared just at how we would resolve this. Yeah. Yeah. I think another thing, too, is we recently. Um, like totally redid our teether line, like just totally changed it. 
And that was kind of scary because we had, we had something that worked. We'd been doing it for seven years, but we knew, we knew that we needed to do something else. We needed to freshen it, and so we just totally changed it. And that was, that was scary. Now it's like awesome. I'm so glad we did that, but it was really scary to begin with. Um, we actually only use uh, jojoba oil and beeswax that we make ourselves, and it's mostly just to bring out the different colors in the wood, but we don't use any paint stains or dyes or anything like that. It's and the teethers that are meant just to go straight in the mouth, those don't have anything on them. Yeah, so we, don't, they, we just use different colors of wood to achieve the different uh, look. So, yes? that we got 30,000 Etsy sales. <laughs> um, you know, we're really thorough about everything. And so... Well, no, no, a surprise. Our puzzles don't sell. Anytime I make puzzles, they don't sell, and I have to discontinue them. Yeah. That always surprises me. Because our kids love them. <laughs> like, we made and we this, love them, yeah. and everything else sells. We made yeah. this one. It was these blocks in a tray, and you could arrange them like all these different ways. It was like 12 blocks or something. And our kids spent hours and hours and hours playing with that. And I think we sold three on Etsy. No, we sold more than that. <laughs> but we didn't sell it wasn't anything. a big seller. And so we finally discontinued it. It just didn't translate on an, in an online yeah. space. And being the Forbes.com article was a surprise. Yeah. Because I used to be afraid of the word afraid of the word entrepreneur. I thought it meant Donald Trump or whatever, and so I would shy away from it until I started honoring myself and my accomplishments. Yeah. Yes. How did you decide to give back by planting a tree for every sale? Like mm. How do you take that out of your business? Is it a percentage? Is it you know like how do you work that into your business? Because I've been trying to find ways to give back as well. Yeah. I just don't know how to figure it out. Yeah. Well, that's how we started. Is we wanted to do something. We wanted there to be a gift with the package. We had actually thought of doing. I had thought of doing like seeds that came with your package or any number of things. And then I saw, um, for us, I saw a t-shirt company doing, we plant a tree for every tea or something. And so I looked into the program they used. And so we plant a tree for every toy that we sell through them. And that, that's why we had to move to the mountains. And, <laughs> and it's a really neat program that they do if you have time to look into it. It's called Trees for the Future. And they, they do reforestation, but they're also helping local communities um, build their economic structure. But um, we just looked and looked until we found something. And then, of course, we're conscientious with um, all of our choices. Yeah. So every once in a while, we'll just add up how many toys we've sold and make the donation. Yeah, so they have a flat rate. It's 10 cents per tree. So we donate 10 cents per toy. We, it's hard. <laughs> well, and we don't separate them, and we don't try. We don't try to, because that would just make us miserable. So we homeschool is one of the things we do, so that our kids are always there. So even if we're not sitting down with just one-on-one -on -one time every time they do their homework, I'm doing something. I'm working while one of them is doing homework across the table from me, across the shipping table. Um, or, and we give them jobs to do for the business as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know any other eight-year-olds that can explain net and gross profit, <laughs> but ours can. So. Yeah, and um, I forgot. Yeah, that was... Oh, they've grown up with it is another important thing. So instead of bringing a business into our family of five, we brought our family of five into a business. So they know how our household works and when they can be with us and when they kind of take care of themselves. And of course, it's been more helpful as they've gotten older. Yeah. But And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have our house and shop together so that it would be part of our family. So we, our business is like three really needy children and then we have our three regular children. <laughs> so <laughs> we just kind of work all around it. So. Yes. Oh, sorry. Cool. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm just curious how you can engage the kids. Like, how can you sit there and have them help do the homework and they don't get distracted or want to leave? And well, 
all kids do that. <laughs> but so I don't. We tie um, them to the chair. You know, you have you have the different jobs that you need to do, and the ones that I need concentration for, I do at certain times, and the ones that I could do in my sleep, I do while I'm helping with homework or taking little breaks. Um, yeah, and we both, uh, a big part of it is we both work and we both parent, so. Yeah, you make breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Absolutely. So I make the toys, and Kimber does everything else. <laughs> That's pretty much how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We trust each other. We talk a lot. We spend hours and hours hashing everything out from, of course, personal things to business things. And we love our jobs. We love our business. Um, and so when we go on a date, we don't mind talking about it. It's not like, oh, let's try to find something else to talk about. We're like, why would we? That's what we love. Yeah, and it works out really well. Like, we design together pretty well because I, I know how to make things, and she knows how to sell things, and so we are able to kind of incorporate both those things. So the designs you see, they're a mix of both of us. Like, some are my designs, some are her designs. Hers are most of them. I have like three. We and they all together. look the same. So. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? I have another question. Yeah. Do you guys have the majority of your sales through Etsy, or do you find that the retail space is starting to pick up a bit more? Um, that's a good question. We. So we have our Etsy shop, and we have our website. And our website's been a beast. Um, through because we built it ourselves and then we hired it out and then we hired it out again and then we found um, uh, we found Goodsy which you know is uh, you know a shopping thing and put it all on there and then we found Squarespace and then we just recently switched to Shopify and I really feel like we're finished Sh um, I mean not that that'll be the end all be all but I really feel like we're done with that really hard part because it just kept bombing not the site itself but the experiences and the end yeah. result so we so anyway oh Etsy so is Etsy's, still our major. Etsy, we sell maybe 70 percent on etsy 30 percent on our website maybe 65 and then like i don't know how much is wholesale we have a bookkeeper so <laughs> he knows <laughs> he does all that. yes yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so when we first started and we were taking the classes, they kept saying, build a team, build a team. I'm like, I can't afford to build a team. And now I kind of see what they mean. Know who you'll go to if you have a legal question. Know who you'll go to if you have these problems. So the first person we brought on to our team was an accountant. She didn't do the bookkeeping, just the taxes. Um, and uh, it was awesome. You, don't have, you only pay for, you know, you pay for the accountant's time the, for the time that they work. It's not like a, they're on payroll, which is how I felt like they were explaining it to us when we took the classes, and that's why I thought we couldn't afford that. And then when we moved to Wisconsin, we incorporated, and we had a lawyer do it, and it was very expensive. And when we moved to Utah, I just did it myself online. And... Um, and now we have a, a new accountant, of course, and she just changed us to an S corp. Um, so, and we, so we and have, then we have a bookkeeper now. So we have a bookkeeper, and he um, he's not an accountant, so his rates are less. Which I didn't realize there were bookkeepers and accountants because I don't know anything about that kind of stuff. We were doing bookkeeping ourselves, and it was terrible. It was the worst week of the year. <laughs> we just do it all at once every yeah. year. It was so every, awful. Every April fourteenth, we'd sit down. <laughs> And yeah, and that's kind of what we were talking about, like know what your business is. We are not bookkeepers. And really, we would do our bookkeeping once a year to get it to our accountant to do taxes. Awful. And, and so we now realize that's not our business, so we need to give that to someone else. Yeah, so I found a bookkeeper and he had tiered pricing and I chose a package and, that's, and he, he's doing the payroll for us now as well. Our accountant was doing the payroll for us in Wisconsin and that was very expensive way to do it. So we have a bookkeeper and an accountant, 
and we have a photographer. We have, right now, we have three part-time employees. Yeah, um, and but we're, Ryan, and our business advisor. Oh, I have a business advisor, yeah, which I can talk about. But we have three part-time employees. We have customer service, um, basically a personal <laughs> assistant, and then a, a shop person. But we're looking for a full-time shipping person because right now I'm doing it. Um, but it's, we live rurally now. We live in, in the mountains, and so it's kind of hard. It limits the pool. Um, and so when one of the parts of reaching out in the community that, and that I started at that time, I started hearing people talk about a business advisor. And Seth Godin talked about it um, in one of his podcasts. And he said a business, oh, I didn't talk about Nate. Um, he said a business advisor is just someone who's more experienced in business than, than you, and they're usually willing to talk to you once a month over lunch if you pay for the lunch. And I was like, oh, I can do that. And I, because before that I thought it was a lot more complicated, you know, giving them shares or whatever. So I um, have a good friend from high school that I was happy to reconnect with, and um, we meet about once a month over lunch, and I spill all my business problems I'm going through, and he gives me feedback, and it's amazing. I love it. <laughs> um, and then one of the things that happened in Wisconsin, but it was more in our, um, our regrowth phase, our, our phase of starting again, was my brother was in the BYU business program, and he used Little Sapling Toys as his project for a lot of things, so we got all this free help from that, and that was really wonderful to help us see what we needed to do. So that's all that I can think of for team right now, but it changes. Yeah. Yes. What's your most successful design? Design. Good design sells itself. Well, nothing sells itself. No. <laughs> good good um, design in Kimber. That's. <laughs> So um, Etsy has been huge, because we only started Instagram like a year ago, and it's brought in new customers, but we still have our, um, our other customers, like our main customer base. And so Etsy was huge in implementing that. We started in 2008, so we were just riding the wave. It's been wonderful. And um, through their articles and features and um, being recognizable, like that headshot where we're holding the toys, as he used that a couple times as examples of headshots and branding and things. Um, and then the articles in magazines, I brought some magazines that have articles in them online, lots of online things. Um, I didn't, I by far did not say yes to every product blogger that contacted me, actually very few. Um, it's just case by case on that. For example, um, Taza from Rockstar Di Diaries, she's really popular, and she contacted me to trade, but I'd never heard of her, and I hemmed and hawed over it. Is this worth it? And then I ended up doing it, and she's huge. We sold so many cameras <laughs> because of um, her posting her little girl with the camera. So um, just case by case, so, and continual. If it's not one thing, it's another, really, but it's always, the more I can work on it, the more we sell. And if I pull back on working, like when we're moving, you can see it in our numbers. And nothing has changed except for the work I'm putting in, in all these tiny little things. You said you had a partner So when we first started, I kept reading in all of these um, helpful articles that you have to have a blog. You won't have a, you won't have a successful shop without a blog. And I hated blogging, just under how much I hated photography. And so I didn't do that, and we were still selling fine. So I was like, oh, OK. And then people started saying that about Facebook business page. And I started. Wait, which wasn't around when we started, just so. Yeah, so, well, yeah. So I started the Facebook business page, which I have, but I don't like that either. I've liked Instagram because with the community thing, it's helped me learn how to connect with people because I've been so awkward for so long. It's kind of reintroduced me to social interaction with 
with people. And it makes writing emails easier because I'm just more at ease with customers from being in contact with them more constantly. Not that I wasn't with email, but my emails were always so professional, and which is good, but they were just so professional and, and uh, Not standoffish. Not approachable, yeah. yeah. So Instagram has actually driven a lot of traffic to our website. So our website used to be like 10% of our sales, and it's we've seen an increase since we started Instagramming a lot, driving traffic to our website. How have you seen Yeah, yeah. Um, just the typical giveaways and, and uh, you know, we got the people who, yeah, collaborations, we're doing. Explain what you did with Disneyland. Oh, <laughs> right, so we went to Disneyland this year in January and we had people could meet up with us in Disneyland and then pick a Disneyland teether that we had made just for the trip. And uh, so that was, we got to meet a bunch of people and the, of course they were people, our, our followers were sharing it with people they knew who were at Disneyland. Um, and I don't know, I, it's been, it's tough and it's frustrating and one, I don't feel like an expert. One thing she's done too is really work on her feed. Like make sure her feed is interesting and professional looking and not, and experimenting with how yeah, much to post. Yeah, experimenting yeah. with how much to post. And For me, it seems like once a day. Lots of other shops can do more than that, and their followers love it. But for me, once a day is all my followers want. Yeah, which is less stress on me, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, which you should all go to at Little Sapling Toys and follow us. And at Little Sapling Toys Shop is my feed where you kind of see more of the production and making. So. Well, so we, when there's a, once in a while, we hit on a really on point giveaway that's not like a loop or that kind of a giveaway, but it's, it's for our customers and it's hosted by someone else that we happen to be a part of. So like Babylist is a, um, a website where you can make a registry for a new baby registry from any store online and they did a shop small program with a giveaway and we got thousands of followers that didn't leave from that because it was perfect yeah but it's not like I had anything to do with that besides making the business what it is and the products and the photography so that's why we always credit the design and the and the branding and all those things. And we always exceed our, we always try to exceed our customers' expectations, both in what they receive, both, well, in the ordering experience, what they receive, and then their customer service, um, if they have to have any afterwards. That's a good question, actually. So Emily right here, she does customer service for me. And before her, I had another girl for years who did it. And it just, that part-time work at home just works perfectly. And we're working on, she's going to come up next month, and we're going to write out all the protocol. Because we don't have it. It's been kind of case by case, and always with the motto to exceed their expectations. But we do need to write it out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what we did was it was pretty easy because it's our only source of income. It was our only source of income. <laughs> but when we when we moved to Idaho, you know, we had to decide between doing little sapling toys, going to school more, or getting a job in restoration. And we were living very frugally. So if we knew if we could sell a hundred dollars worth of toys a day, that it would just cover our living expenses. So for us, it just evolved from just covering our living expenses. We would just pay ourselves that much. And then as we had an accountant and she would show us how things were doing, we're like, oh, we can hire someone or, oh, we can pay ourselves a little bit more. 
So for us, it was like a once a year thing. It'll be better now that we have a bookkeeper. <laughs> but it was that once a year thing, seeing how it looked on, you know, on paper and what we could do. So, yeah. Yes. Um, recommendations, but not recommendations from, uh, recommendations from other people who um, not have a business similar to yours, but maybe are on the same scale, that kind of thing. Because in Wisconsin, I was getting rec recommendations from people in the Chamber of Commerce. We were really involved with the Chamber of Commerce there. So people in the Chamber of Commerce gave me the recommendation for the lawyer, and the lawyer gave me the recommendation for the um, accountant. And they were all good, but when we moved here, we got recommendations from like the woman who owned the title company where we bought our house from and she had a much better recommendation because she does what we do. She owns a business. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> No. And that's because of us. <laughs> it doesn't we, work with us. We're really unorganized, and so it just doesn't work for us. But, but everyone who comes, most everyone who comes to our house comments on how organized we are, and it's because we're unorganized. So to run a business, we have to put all these systems in place so it can stay. So we're piles of paper type of people and no routine type of people, but there are some things that are daily, like the post office. We leave for the post office at four. They come to pick up, but um, we're never ready in time, so we just go down. <laughs> so, and we could have it ready for the next day, but it's a nice drive. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I've tried to do. Um, like one, two, three day a week, but if I miss a day, then it just backs up so much that it's overwhelming and I can't, it takes so long to catch up once I get backed up. So I really need to just keep up every day. And in Wisconsin, we had a full-time person shipping and it was wonderful. And so I'm trying to get back to a full-time person shipping, because it's, yeah. So when we started out, Etsy wouldn't let you use a third-party shipper, so we had to use every we had to do everything ourselves. So we've kind of looked into it a little bit, but so many of our products are personalized that it would just add so much more time and cost and energy and everything. So we just do it all ourselves. So we use a shipping management program. Yeah, we use ShipStation. Yeah, it imports all our orders and then we print the labels from there. And manages and, them. Yeah. And we use um, the USPS for most of our things. And this really helped me. My business advisor told me, um, so if this is incorrect, you can blame him, but my business advisor told me that doing the bulk shipping, like um, UPS and FedEx, it really, the cost break, is really only significant if you can fill up a whole truck. I just spent so many years feeling guilty for not, okay, because the way it works with UPS, they won't tell you what the rates are. You have to do it for three weeks and then the new rates initiate. And so you have to try it out for three weeks. And for us, that would have been a huge amount of money um, before the rates went down and then to not know how far they're going to go down. Um, but really they only go down significantly if you have just a truckload. So, um, and, we, and we sell a lot of light things. The teethers and the blocks are light, and, and we can use the regional rate boxes, which are like flat rate, and so USPS is it for us. Yes. We just kind of figured out what works for us. So we just change that tracking number every month. So every month it will just have that. Like right date. now it's 0615. Yeah. Um, and then as for the small batch manufacturer, we're registered as a small batch manufacturer, so we're exempt. Um, and I do that every year. He doesn't even know about it. <laughs> um, and we were members, we're members of the HTA, the Handmade Toy Alliance, and we're helping with the 
the CPSA rule, CPSIA rulings. I don't know if any of you remember, but it was when we were first in business and um, yeah, big to do. It's a big to do, but things are good now, and it's settled off, and and you can register, and if you want more information, I can help you out. What kind of content does the networks do that? Uh, creative collaborative every second Tuesday at the Provo Rec Center. Um, yeah, so we do that, and then there's part of like. For me, I have to keep up on the industry, like what's going on, what tools, what kind of things are out there. And so every two years, there's a conference in Vegas. It's like the woodworking conference, and we're going to that this year. And um, I just learned so much from there because there's so many things. And so and we listen to a lot of podcasts. A lot of yeah, and a lot we, of business. And he reads a lot of wood magazine, wood and mm -hmm. um, con not construction, but woodworking magazines. Yeah. In industry publications, mm -hmm. basically. And. Yeah, there's a couple. There's one called uh, The Accidental Creative, which is a really good one. I like to listen to that. Um, and then Seth Godin. And then... I like listening to other small business owners who have podcasts as well. I, uh, it doesn't keep my attention to listen to it long term usually, but I like to listen to some of those and see how they're running their families and businesses together. Like there's one called Goat Milk Stuff, and she has nine kids in a business. Um, and about 50 goats. And then um, audiobooks, uh, business audiobooks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the E Myth and um, the Purple Cow one by Seth Godin. And but you know we we spend most uh, we spend most of our time doing. <laughs> so we have the pile of books just like anyone else that we want to read, but we're spending our time. Yeah. Making the business, yeah. <laughs> um, so the question was, how has personalization affected our business? And it's pretty much just to took it to a whole new dimension, like being able to add that on. Like people can buy the product and then pay an extra six dollars for us to put their name on it, and so. It was, it's interesting because we had to add that whole thing into our process and it kind of changed. And it took some trial and error mm -hmm. of how to add it to our process. Yeah. Yeah. But I always wanted to have um, a large range of prices in our products and um, it has helped us do that because we can have small things that are personalized like a yo-yo or a couple blocks with letters on them um, or the, the freebies back there tonight. Um, we can have these low end things and then um, like these are some of our, this walnut cube chair is our most expensive product. So Squarespace is wonderful and beautiful and less expensive. Um, but it's design and, and website based and not and then they added e-commerce so it just wasn't really powerful enough so I decided to put the extra money into Shopify to have something that was more powerful and that could handle my products and I am lucky to have my brother who is an electrical engineer but he can just figure out anything with computers so he helped me set up the site I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself but I can always count on him our website got hacked once that was one of the things we went through by someone where in Malaysia or something and he fixed it at, sorry. no it was just a it was through what was it WordPress yeah. yeah so Shopify the main difference is Shopify is an e-commerce site mainly and yeah. Squarespace is a design site with e-commerce added yeah so it is more complicated it's not as easy as Squarespace but especially for having a large range of products it was better for us because um, you know we have to go through and edit batches of products and it takes a long time awesome